August. I'm. Uh, I live in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, okay. I'm 19, but I have my medical card for herniated discs. Um, ah, I'm a second generation hippie and cannabis enthusiast. I grew up around the plant um, and the everything about it. And uh, I've been doing a lot of research, watching a lot of videos with you and. Frenchie Cannoli, and I'm doing my first medical grow this year, and I'm going to try and make hashish. Oh, good for you. Great. Yeah. Great. yeah, Frenchie's a good friend of ours. Well, we you're, you're bound to learn a lot today from Chia. Uh, <laughs> I did. I've been meaning to, yeah. I, I, I missed the last couple ones, but I've been meaning to check these out. Great, yeah. good. They are recorded, so you can check them out and so on. And I also, Heather's see, here. Yeah, I see Heather. Heather. Hi, how you doing, Hello, Heather? Heather, Heather, Heather and, you and the guys. Yeah, welcome on the show. Yeah, How are you? Hi, Heather. It's so good I'm great. to hear your voice. I'm missing you. Yeah, we don't have our I meetings. We, for too. so many years, we've seen each other at all these meetings that we've been having. And since COVID, you know, it's really been yeah. kind of sad yeah. to break up with the community, not seeing each yeah. other too much. So, well, that's yeah. one reason we do these sessions right. with Swami. So, that's right, to stay in touch for sure. And this sure. is, and who is Neil? Am I pronouncing that right, Neil Evans? Niall Evans. Or Niall? The, uh, the muted, uh, you have to unmute and uh, maybe you could put your picture on too. That's if you don't know how name. to do that, it's in the bottom left of your screen. There's mute and video both down there in the bottom left of your screen. Anyone who wants to come in. And uh, this is my partner, Cassie. Oh, hi, Cassie, how oh, you doing? Hi, Cassie, Welcome nice to meet Welcome to you. Session of Swami, right. Great. All right, while we're doing that and then, uh, Greg, why don't you say a few words? We haven't heard from you for a while. You are one of the real regulars, actually, right? Yeah, how's it going in San Francisco? You, you and Heidi are both in San Francisco, I know. You getting the rain there? San Francisco has been raining, raining, raining. Yeah, good. 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 Uh -huh. And I had my eyes examined today, so I can't see an effing thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well we can see you which is good anyway and then we can hear you also and then down below is heidi how you doing heidi another regular I'm great i'm really good yeah. thank you happy thursday it's, i look forward to happy seeing thursday. you yeah, and i'm so glad you're getting the rain in there yeah, yes it's, it's sunny yeah. right this okay. minute oh good yeah. excellent okay. excellent Okay, uh, wow. Richard Vate, you have to unmute yourself, I believe. Hi, Richard. Yeah. And now, Jane. Now we can uh, say hello. Hey, Swami. I guess my how camera's like very, but I'm on an old phone, but hey, how's it going? Can uh, you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hear, yeah. It's the light above your head. You want to have it so the light is behind the phone. Yeah, uh, yeah, there, yeah, there you go. Much better. Better. Yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. It looks like you're also in a very cold place. Well, yes, I'm in Philadelphia and I'm I'm inside now, but I'm gonna step out in a minute to smoke because I can't really smoke uh, in my house. Uh, I see. So I see. I'm all bundled up to I go see. outside. I see. Oh God. Yeah, I spent some time in Philadelphia. I was at uh, the University of Pennsylvania for a little while. Had a great time there. Met some great people. Philly's a great town. Love it. Yeah. I'm born, you know, I'm 38 and I'm born and raised in Philadelphia. So yeah, Philly is really a good scene now. I only really started smoking cannabis about eight years ago, but right now, you know, it's not legal technically, but yeah, I get it cheaper here than I would get it when I'm going to go to Arizona next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the traditional market, we call it these days. So I mean, now, it's, okay, it's sure. the taxes. All right, exactly. Oh, yeah. it, it is. It's the taxes. That's for sure. Yeah. We all know about those taxes. Yeah. So, so I think yeah. I found I found Swami through YouTube because I think it, it knew I, I use cannabis because I look at videos, uh -huh. but it also knows I, I've been to India, kind of. So I think it made 
two and two together and kind of uh, like suggested oh, wow. one of your videos and I started looking at you. And then the last like three Swami uh, sessions I've done, it was really cool. How long did well, you go? Uh, I went last December for two weeks. Uh, we went to Delhi and Agra, and then we went to Chennai. Beautiful. Oh, good. And I did not okay. smoke marijuana okay. at all in India. Yeah, well, <laughs> mostly they smoke what they call chadas there, which is a kind of form of hashish that yeah. they use. Uh, yeah, the cannabis flower is not very good. Yeah, they grow seeded yeah, flowers. Not uh, really very good. I was there, with my best yeah. friend's parents, so there wasn't really an opportunity to do it. Okay. But it was amazing. <laughs> India was India is worth well, a trip. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, I hope you can go back and yeah, spend more yeah. time. More than one trip, yeah, too, by the way. <laughs> you can yeah, see sorry, what it did to me and really Nikki. Great life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you for having these, okay. and it's very nice to talk to you. Okay, Thank great. You. Nice to welcome. Likewise. So let's see. Um, April's there somewhere. And Stephen Shrub. How you doing, Stephen? And Charles. Okay. Back. The, Good to see you. And did Chia drop off or something? Nope, reason? Chia's right there. Oh, there she is. Okay, let's just start with Chia. We got enough. Kind of right here. Kana so, uh, kind of must say. Yeah, Stephen Shrub. Now I recognize you there, Steve. Good. Nice to see you. And April's going to put her face in there pretty soon, I suppose. And Charles, Gary, we got Jane yep, Harris. All right. Charles is here so I want to introduce Harris. you all to Chia Rodriguez, uh, who's joining us today. She's a, 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 Men, a Mendonesian yes. from way back, a Mendocino <laughs> County. Uh, and so we're going to ask her some about what she's doing. And uh, she, she lives in a place called Greenfields. And Greenfields is kind of part of hippie mythology. So uh, maybe we want to start there with you talking about- Actually, I'd like what? to just start with the very present moment. Chia, you had a giant tree fall on your house oh, last right, night right. in the storm. Yeah, so, the night before last, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, how much snow did you get over on your side of the county? Well, we got more snow than we've had since the night my, my son was born, which was February 8th of 2001. And we got wow. probably about eight inches here, which doesn't seem like a lot to most people probably, but um, the forest that we live in is um, probably 50-50 firs and oaks, and then a little bit of madrone sprinkled and some bay trees. And so the oak trees just could not handle the weight of all that snow with the drought yeah. over these years. They right. just really were so dry on the inside. And so it was like a light, it sounded like thunder and lightning. And we just, my husband was like, what is that sound? And we went outside and you could hear across the canyon about every 10 seconds, a tree falling down for like oh. five hours. It was yeah. really intense and probably the most scary experience I've ever had being inside my own home. Um, I mean, if you go follow my, my farm page, which is River Shy, uh, it's spelled, I'll put it in the comments, but R-I-D-E-R, T-X-A-I on Instagram, you'll see some photos and some videos from the, um, from the storm. And we had probably about 200 trees fallen within about 300 feet of the house. Um, it was incredible. It looks like a hurricane came through here. So we did have one tree, wow. a massive tree fall on our, on my product room, unfortunately. Um, smashed the guest house in the product room um, and went through both roofs. And so we had to move everything out of there, of course, and all the product was fine, but it's leaking and we have a contractor coming next week. So it'll all be oh, fine, yeah. it's, it's awesome. you know. We saw those pictures, it's scary. We actually had two giant oak branches fall down, you know, branches that are like that big around and like 30 feet long, we had to them, but fortunately they fell away from the house. Oh, we just had yeah, those ones things away a lot. They can do a lot of damage. Oh, you yeah. think that oh, yeah. they're just a small branch, but a small branch can wipe out <laughs> your car. Or, oh, yeah. yeah, we had quite, yeah. quite, a, um, quite a couple days. Now, uh, pardon the chainsaw noise in the background. We have about six guys outside working on chainsaws as we speak. <laughs> oh, so. <God. laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. wow. I imagine your whole that whole area probably a lot of people had stuff fall on their houses and yeah. stuff. I mean, yeah, it was interesting. Sure. Yeah, I've been talking to a lot of people the last few days, of course, on the Instagram and everybody's like commenting on Facebook and stuff. I posted a bunch of stuff there too. And you know, a lot of people had issues, of course, with the snow and especially people who have hoop houses and greenhouses. 
there was a lot of damage oh. to a lot of folks, oh, okay. like just the weight, you know, the weight of the snow. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I took I took the panels off my tiny mini uh, greenhouse. I have a little, you know, a kit kind of greenhouse and you can slide the panels off the roof. So they've been mm. off. So I was lucky on that one. But yeah, wow. we have the same kind yeah. of forest that you have, the dug fir, the oak and the madrone mixture and so but on. But I think the difference mm -hmm. is, Chia, actually, it's the same thing. The drought is like so much dried up the trees that they're brittle and that extra weight just they makes are. them break. So we basically... Yeah. get at least as much snow every year where we are um, for some reason oh really and so they kind yeah. of You're pretty yes, high. I always it, it saves us money from hiring very expensive tree limbers to come in <laughs> because we know that every year it's going to get kind of yeah. weeded out you know the trees. yeah exactly so, and, then, and, then we, and then we wood chip all the branches and that goes on the pot garden yeah. so uh you know and the big ones, we get free firewood. We just have to cut That's it right. up. So there are these things. You have to live with nature with what it gives you. Well, it's I was true. just saying well, on my my post to share, you know, earlier was like, um, what, we can talk about ladybugs later, but my, my quote at the beginning of the ladybugs movie is like, you don't own the land, the land owns you. And it's really, yes. really true. The work never ends. It's like, you think, you right. know, I, I literally thought a couple of days ago, kind of bored what what kind of project can i get into you know? <laughs> i don't ever think that again because <laughs> now we have a lot of oh what's, what's this week's <laughs> crisis well what really happened to us is we, we had a water pipe break right at our tanks so we had ah. about uh i don't know we must have had pretty close to thirty thousand gallons of water and then we ended up with about 700 after they yeah. broke because i didn't oh, find out till the next morning right so fortunately, it's rainy season, so yeah. we're going to fill them all up. But it's like, you know, it's just always something. It's always something. It that, sure you know, is. We live at the edge of the wilderness, so in the wilderness, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it's easier country life. Yeah. Well, it's, it's 420, <laughs> so if everyone wants to uh, light up. Oh, yeah. so good to see you, Chris Russo here. Chris Russo, Yay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris. Yeah, and Magesh Mahagan and uh, April, Otis and Taco. Carter, we got people from, looks like from Great. India and so on. Great. All right, so light up if you got it. So, so yeah, so Chia, you live on Greenfield Ranch, correct? Which is yeah. a really unusual part of Mendocino County. I mean, maybe you can explain to people, I mean, this is one of the original hippie communal living situations, right? Really? Correct. How did it all come to be? Well, it started in 1972. There was a fellow named Tim Baker who um, was a student, I believe, at UC Berkeley. And he got um, wind of this land for sale. It was about 5,600 acres, I believe, maybe 52 or 5,600 acres. And he got this- That's huge. Huge, it is really huge. We have 28 miles of road on our on our land here. You know, it's wow. kind of like all these veins, right? But um, so he bought this land and then he decided to get a bunch of his friends in on it and parcel it up. So, you know, this was 1972. Um, he worked with the county to create smaller parcels and um, create tenants in common situations. So we, for instance, my land, I own 40 acres of a 220 acre parcel. Um, and so people just kind of put in what they can. And on some places there's, you know, 20, 30, 40 owners on one parcel because everybody had, you know, at that time it was like $100 an acre. And, you know, my dad, for instance, bought property here. He had $5,000 and he bought his 40 acres with that. Um, wow. But yeah, so in 1972, but my dad got there in about 1976, 75 or 76, I believe. Um, and also, my husband's father is an original owner here, too. Um, so he was one of the first people to buy land up here. And so a lot of people came from the Berkeley area because um, of the UC Berkeley connection. And then a lot of people came from the Southern California, San Diego area. So we have a, a huge contingent of San Diego folk. Um, my dad is one of those. And um, yeah. my husband's dad is a Berkeleyite. So we got a little but bit But you of essentially grew um, up there, right? Yeah, I was born on Greenfield. So my parents um, had their little house and uh, kind of just barely being built at the time. Um, they lived in tents and crazy structures while they built their place. And um, I was born inside the house once it was built in um, 1979. 
and uh yeah just at, at home next to the <laughs> next to the wow. midwives and, 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 and all the all the neighbors there was a lot of people there apparently were people Say that growing again? right away were people growing cannabis right away or is that something that developed or was that the it reason it developed went? over time yeah like so my dad for instance was a teacher and he he retired out of his um he took his retirement to buy the land and, and do all the, you know, the infrastructure there. And um, he was a substitute in town, but he mainly, he grew a little bit of cannabis. And back in those days, you know, he could get rid of it for $4,000, $4,500 a pound. So he barely had to do much to live a pretty plush life. He'd kind of take off in the winters and go to Mexico for half the year and he'd come back, start seeds and do it all over again. So oh, yeah, I, I grew up in that lifestyle. This is pretty wild. You know, a lot of the people around here cultivate cannabis. Well, you're, you're one of the legacy yeah. OG uh, originals. So it's, uh, you know, listen up folks, <laughs> because this started with people going back to the land and they didn't come up here to grow cannabis. They came up here to live with nature and to get away from society. And it just seemed like cannabis was something that, like you say, hey, you have a couple plants, you get eight or 10 grand and so on. So it was just a kind of a natural development and everybody kind of gave each other seeds and plants yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, and so Chia, does, does Greenfield have like a, is there a main building where you can all meet or something? Yeah, or actually, like that? yeah. there is actually, um, we call it the ranch house. Um, there is a central common land. So back in the days, there was a school there. I went to like preschool, kindergarten there. Um, there was a community garden. There's a community spring. Um, there's a lot of water coming out of that mountain. And so um, people would go there to get water and to cook food. There was a communal kitchen. And now we have parties there mostly. There's not really a lot going on there um, these days. But it was the original uh, Greenfields, um, the cup, Mrs. Greenfield, I don't even know their first names actually. Um, they lived out there with a, they had a cattle ranch and they had a lot of Native Americans uh, working there. And um, it was a stop for um, Black Bart actually. So this was one of the, his trails to and from really? inland to the coast. Mm -hmm. I love wow. it. Yeah, yeah, it's Mendo. Wow, <laughs> so. that's incredible. And so when you were growing up, was your father, were they growing as well? Your parents were growing at some point? They were. I was actually born on Stay High Drive is the name of the road that I was born on. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, it was not it. named actually for being high. It was named because it like went up the ridge and kept you, I guess. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love that. Great, so, yeah, so, so my parents did grow for, for sure. I just yeah. want to say to people, this is out somewhere in the vicinity of Ukiah up, up in Mendocino County, up in the mountains. I'm not going to be more specific than that, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, but I want, was there some sort of government or rules or parliament or structure or council that ran the green fields? Yeah, so um, we have a, uh, we have CCNRs and bylaws that we have to follow. Um, we have assessments that we pay uh, quarterly for road repairs and the ranch house repairs and all, and all bookkeeping and things like that. Um, there's a board of directors, which currently my brother's the president of and my father-in-law is the treasurer. So it's kind of, that's how tight knit it is. There's about a hundred and maybe 300 people at the height um, when it was really wow. getting going. And right now I would say there's about 150 residents. Oh. Um, and a lot of empty places, uh, you know, land that nobody built anything on or, or just didn't stick around. So um, there was a lot of people in the heyday, you know, there was a lot of babies being born when I was born, a whole ton of them. Um, so it was, you know, ripe, ripe for having a school and doing all kinds of community things like that. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, so most of you now are probably second generation that are still up there doing your, your stuff. Yeah, there's kind of been like this resurgence, I, I guess, like um, when my husband and I um, had our first son, we were literally like the only second generation folks here and the first ones to have a child on this ranch um, of that generation. And so, uh, you know, shortly after it was kind of like this whole slew of people moving back and having kids and including my brother, he moved back and, and had his son here too. Um, and the, you know, the third generation is more sparse. I think a lot of people 
when, you know, they moved away, they went to college, they got careers, they're having kids. And then, you know, they're, they come and go. And, um, you know, there's a, a very few amount of children around these days, maybe like a dozen or two dozen wow. maximum. Yeah. And, and how many legal growers do you have up there? Oh, let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, I think, out of all those. Uh, we had a lot, lot of people try in the beginning when, when um, in Mendocino County, when the 9.31 program started, tons of people were in that program. But then when it moved over through Prop 64, uh, you know, we had to all apply for, for um, permits with the county. Um, a lot of people attempted that and pretty quickly realized that with all the water board issues and the CDFW, which is the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and, you know, all these things sort of started stacking up. Um, a lot of the first generation folks decided that they just wanted to be retired, really. They didn't want to go through all that rigmarole, like, right. to do what they've always been doing. Yeah. So a lot of people just decided that it wasn't for them. Um, but I think we have five um, licensees and three of those are second generation. Cool. Okay. So did you yeah. actually learn growing from your parents then? I mean, you were, were you out there as a young kid in the fields <laughs> doing it or what? Yeah, um, well, my mom and my dad split up when I was three because my mom wasn't into cannabis. Um, and so she oh. moved to town. And so mm. I was a weekend summer kid. Um, you know, Christmas time, I would come up here at that point. So once I got a car and I was on my own, with my own wheels, I would be up here more often. But um, yeah, so my dad had, you know, like I said, a pretty small farm considering, you know, compared to these days. And we had about, I would say about a solid acre of blackberry bushes. And my dad had carved out these tunnels. It kind of looked like a map of like a gopher <laughs> tunnel system. It was incredible. Wow. So he he carved out all these like pathways through the blackberry brambles and really learned how to bonsai cannabis, which is kind of a cool thing wow. that you don't see that much except for in indoor scenes these days. Um, and so every once in a while, you, you know, through the tunnels, there would be a little open spot. And this is like during the Reagan era and before, right? And so um it was pretty sketchy helicopters all the time you know people were getting busted running through the woods with garbage bags full of pot and um and so you know you wanted to be really you want to hide it of course and so he would do this thing where he would like carve out these little areas that were open to more sunlight and you'd have one big plant kind of sticking up out of there and they would be all over this whole acre. So it wasn't really super obvious, but I'm sure they could probably see that stuff from the air because, you know, blackberry bushes aren't all green. So, but, you know, he, he did right, his thing. Right, right. I, just, I just remember like climbing through the blackberry bushes. He would have like um, metal roofing material because it's, you know, it's a couple feet wide all along through there. And so he'd drag all his nutrients in there and, and you kind of wow. could tell who, you could tell who was growing in the blackberry toolies like us because everybody would have scratch marks all over them in the summertime. And <laughs> it was pretty uh, funny. I, I have like, one that's like still like in my back. And I think it out. <laughs> What's that? Sounds like Br'er Rabbit in the briar patch and so yeah. on, but it's what you had to do to yeah. escape from <laughs> from the law yeah. it's funny but what a lot of work i mean those old days of logging yeah, in the bags absolutely. of soil and everything else yep. i mean i mean i guess it wasn't actually regenerative growing really i mean it sort of was it was probably right in the soil but yeah i'm sure everyone was using different nutrients back then and everything maybe else, yeah. i mean a so, lot of people uh, grew up in trees they put platforms that was another methodology people would put like plywood yeah. or something up into a tree and then they would put a pot up there and then they would use like a rope pulley system to get their bags of soil up there and their nutrients and stuff. Um, I've been around on a lot of the parcels near us and seen some of those remnants, you know, they're still there in a lot of places. Amazing. So, so as, yeah. as a child, when, um, when the helicopters would come, I mean, I, I remember the helicopters too, but I didn't grow up up here. I was grown up when I was doing that. Um, that must have been pretty traumatic. You know, yeah, yeah, as a child, were you ever scared about your dad and what was going to happen up there? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, 
I have this reoccurring nightmare that I've had my entire life, probably since I was about four years old, of a helicopter with a searchlight and we, us all kind of running and hiding from the helicopter. Wow. And, um, you know, it was traumatic. We didn't ever have any nighttime helicopters that I remember, but that's just how, you know, my, my, <laughs> my mind has it. But, um, you know, my dad would always say like, do not tell anyone what your father does. Like, you know, I could go to jail and you don't want to be responsible for that, you know? And so I just say my dad's retired a school teacher. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I was trained really, you just don't say anything. And, um, I'm sure people knew, cause I'm sure I came to school with particles on my <laughs> sweater or whatever, yeah, right but your sweater. it smelled like weed sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but but now, yeah, you know, it was the big fear. It was a lot of fear well, I, instilled. I, I, you made me think when I came up to visit your ranch when we came up uh, mm -hmm. because of the Appalachians project, right? And so all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of us at your ranch. Uh, and your husband's there. And then these are like four people from the California Department of Food and Agriculture, environmental thing, right. looking at your crop, counting the plants. And so it's about as opposite as it could possibly be or what you just told yeah. us. And that's how much it's all changed, right? And you're there smiling and there's, so, oh, very impressive, lovely. And what are these plants over here? And these are clones and these are early ones, so on and so forth. It was really very impressive. And uh, well, the difference yeah, well, is between that and having the sheriff really out, weird. I mean, during that 9.31 program, we literally walked our weird. crop with a sheriff with a gun on his holster, you know, and a third so party yeah. certifier. Yeah, yeah. pretty Same sketchy. With us. I mean, Same with us. yeah, right. Yeah, you were in the 9.31 program too, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. you know, when, so when I was growing up, it was always like, you know, you never wanted anybody like the building inspector, God forbid a building inspector showed up or somebody from the county or, you know, something like that. And, and so now we're literally inviting them over because we, you know, it's through that fear that was really instilled in us um, so deeply as kids. Um, and even up until, you know, adulthood when we were cultivating in the blackberry bushes and the, you know, the Madrone forest or the Manzanita forest for years too. Um, and so, we always thought, you know, as soon as there's a pathway forward, as soon as there's some legal way to do this, we will do that because our children don't deserve to live in fear. Um, you know, like we we live in the flight path, and so there's always helicopters. And actually, we've been used as a target during the um, camp and comet programs as as sort of like a, an example, because we were very close to the airport and, and we're right in this flight path. And so they were always just going over us anyways. So they just kind of like show off and mess with us. Um, and so, you know, oh, that- Lucky, lucky that, you. So yeah. now you have, this group, you have this group called Mendo Generations. Can you talk about that, Mendo Generations a little bit? That's your community yeah. action and you have website and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, how did we that sure come do. into being? Well, um, yeah, it came into being because of this the thing I was just talking about, because I think a lot of people um, were tired of living in fear and living like they had to hide their lifestyle. And, you know, it's it's exhausting, really. Um, and every year it's kind of that all those things come up and you, you're hiding what you're doing and you're making sure you're kids don't go to school with weed in their hair and you know it's it's a lot to think about um especially when you have young kids and so what as we started going down the pathway first in the 9.31 program and then as prop 64 came about people were starting to talk about getting licensed and permitted at the county level and we decided to jump on the train um and so we started talking to everybody about it. And a lot of people started asking me questions because I was really, you know, I was doing all this paperwork. I was doing all this compliance stuff and sort of advising them. Um, and people want to kind of follow along. And so we started with um, three of our, uh, or two of our closest neighbors actually were the first members of MendoGen. Um, and Mendocino Generations, we say MendoGen for short, but, um, is a group now of about 50 uh, farms in Mendocino County. Wow. At its height, we had about 65 members. Um, and through that permitting process, 
Some people just couldn't make it through. Some people decided not to. And so we rested at about 50 members at this point. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of those folks were legacy cultivators. That was part of our mission um, to really help uh, small farmers who are sun-grown cannabis farmers really is, is the ultimate goal. We do have a lot of people in the group who have, you know, maybe they have a greenhouse as part of their scene or they have some hoop houses and they do some light deprivation as part of their scene. But our focus is uh, regenerative sun-grown cannabis farmers, legacy cultivators. Right. Yeah. Great. And do you actually, um, so do you help them with the paperwork and all that actually, or how does that work? I mean, do you, how do, do you help them sell it or? Oh boy, I sure did in the beginning. I really was helping people along, you know, just kind of pulling them along behind me because I was <laughs> sort of forcing the way at that point and um, was helping them get with the water board and, and um, start the CDFW process and, and all that stuff. Um, and at some point that became a lot too much for me um, because it, it's so complicated. Every site has very specific um, <laughs> issues and it's it's so complicated. And there was started to become so many people kind of jumping on the Mendogen train that I just, I couldn't handle all that. And some people, you know, in the group were great with paperwork too. And so we started, you know, getting help with certain things and accounting and things like that and trying to train people how to, use a computer even. I mean, we're talking first generation hippies in the woods who barely just got the internet, let alone know how to use a computer or an iPhone for God's sake. I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was helping folks figure out how to fill out these forms online and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I mean, people were trained in the day to never keep record. You don't write anything down. You've got to keep it in here or you've got to stash it somewhere that no one's going to ever find it. Because if somebody finds a list of, you know, Joe Schmo trimmed this amount of pounds and I paid him this amount of money, like you do not want that list sitting around, right? So people were, were hiding, getting really crafty with where they were hiding that kind of information and definitely was not putting it on a computer or in an email. And so it, part of this was sort of pulling people out of the closet. It's like, it's okay. You can talk about it. We can email about it. We, you can text me. And, you know, people don't even want to like text a picture of their, their garden or put it on Instagram for that matter. Um, and so by example, we just kind of like normalizing this process and normalizing our lifestyle and our culture and it really is that here in Mendocino County it is a culture and we are on the brink of losing that culture right now and we can talk about that more later yeah. but um yeah. you know it's really serious business right at this moment and my my heart is really heavy for the the small cannabis farmers right now and then you know it's hard to see the the light and the hope is you know we're holding on but it's it's there's a lot of cards stacked against us right now and you know we really did forge the way yeah. here so it's a shame. Yeah, no, it's a challenge for sure. Do you actually help people get their product to store? Well, uh, Mendocino Generations did do that in the beginning. I was acting as a distributor really before this Prop 64 happened. And so I was doing lots of sales and connecting people with dispensaries mostly at that point because distributors didn't quite exist yet. It was kind of like that right. sort of came about with this Prop 64. Um, before that, most dispensaries would have their own brand and you'd sell to a dispensary and, you know, they would do their own packaging or they would, um, you know, there's no more picking and butt out of a jar in a dispensary these days. But back in the day, that that's how it worked. And so you just sold them your bulk weed. And if you were the there at the right time <laughs> with the right weed, you got a sale, basically. Um, but yeah. so, you know, I, I helped a lot of people get, get to just, um, distribution through the dispensary channel. And, um, then when Prop 64 uh -huh. passed, when Prop 64 passed, we decided, you know, getting a distributed license is quite rigorous. It's super expensive. It's, it's a lot. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I stopped of course, doing those sales myself, but I started um, connecting people with better channels, distribution, processing, and all that kind of stuff that we have to deal with these days. That's great. Yeah, no, we are definitely in a critical moment right now. So probably a lot of you aren't 
I doubt, unless you're growing here in California, you're not going to know about what's going on. I mean, one of these issues is something called the California Environmental Quality Act, known as CEQA. Uh, and this is something yeah. <laughs> that in our county, Mendocino, they, they did it incorrectly, basically. Mm-hmm. They set it all up wrong, and now they're paying for it. And, and we're paying for and it. We're paying for we're it. Paying and we're just it. praying that they're going to figure out how that we can get through this process in time for the state to still issue us annual licenses so we don't have to quit or start all over again. So, and it yeah. could end up costing us all thousands and thousands of dollars by the time we get through this process. So um, it's yep. really quite quite a thing we're going through. And on top of that, the county is really trying to expand the size of grows that are allowed in our county. And so, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You could say, okay, hey, it's gonna go legal nationally, who knows? So we need to grow a lot more weed because Mendocino weed's the best and it should be everywhere in the world. But it's also a real question of quantity over quality. And Mendocino is very proud of its quality. And they're now discussing actually allowing people to grow 10% of their acreage up to 100 acre parcels in cannabis. So that would mean if you have a hundred acres or more, you could grow up to 10 acres of weed. Yeah. And this this is is atrocious. I don't agree with this. I don't like that personally. I'm not into it because so now you have, I see people nodding their heads and clapping, but you know, really for the legacy cultivator, that is just, it's taken the feet out from under us. And, and the thing is, it's going to wipe out the culture because what what you're talking about is yeah people own okay so if they own 100 acres they can grow 10 acres of solid cannabis well that's more you know more than <laughs> i mean that's insane that's just one farm right and so i mean yeah. considering people like like us who we live where we farm when you have a farm that's like 10 acres and things like this, this is just monocropping at that point. You cannot grow quality cannabis right. at that scale. It's just, it's, it's not the same. Yeah. No, it's not. And it's also inviting in the big corporations. You got it. I mean, that's- In Newark County to say, oh yeah. And yeah, they'll, they'll be growing a lot for biomass. No question, it won't be sure. all just flour, but it's still real, like you say, it's gonna change the quality and the culture here in our county of what we know. I mean, there'll always be those of us that are those special legacy farmers, but it's just kind of frustrating to see after everything we've been going through to just suddenly they're gonna open their doors up to this. Um, right, I mean, I mean right we're basically so inviting, well, we moved, you know, we I, moved I, to I, the I, woods to get away from the man, right? And now we're just like inviting the, yeah, right. the man in to, to grow weed they think they can grow it better than than we can so (laughs) i guess well those of us who make it through the funnel will uh put them to the test with that (laughs) yeah Yeah. i I just want to when you were talking before about in the old days in greenfield and the helicopters and so on there was there was that level of paranoia that as the season went along it got higher and higher and higher until you had those big beautiful colas those buds and it wasn't just from the helicopters and, and camp and all those others. There was also marijuana rustlers who could come in in the middle of the night and cut all your tops off. They might not take the whole plant, but the, they could just take 30 or 40 tops right there. You know, so there was this whole level of paranoia. It's still there. So I mean, well, no, yeah, but I mean, it was, it's is different now. That's what I want to do. It is. The rustlers well, are there. The wrestlers are still there, that's for sure. But the other part now is like, there's a different kind of paranoia and the paranoia is about not filling out the paperwork, right? You got and it. That you, know, <laughs> that you have to do all these, <laughs> and jump through all these hoops. You know, we, we have a pond, right? And we've been through a situation where we have to take the pond out. Oh no, maybe we can keep it. Oh no, we have to take it out. Oh no, maybe we can keep it. Then we get to just, and, so, and the same with our bridge and so on. And so it's just the, the unknowing of yeah. what they're going to require. And then they change it even after they require it. So uh, for anyone else in another state that you're coming on and you're starting to get legal, don't do it the way we did it, right? You really yeah. take a look at how it was done and think about the legalization, both on the county and city level and on the state level as well. Yeah, curiously, yeah. Oklahoma is the most liberal yeah. place yeah. in the country. Who yeah. would have thought it? But, but yeah. in the old days, the biggest secret is where is the can, where's the grower, right? 
right? You know, because no one, you know, only the dealer knew maybe where the grower, that was the big secret. And the grower's big secret is where is there, where do they get their water? Yeah. Right. And so now, before you can even apply for a thing, you got to tell them not only not only where you are on, you know, latitude, longitude, you got to tell where every one of your water tanks is latitude and longitude and yeah. all the pipes between them. I mean, it's like they are really uh, with a gnat's ass up your ass. And yep. it's just terrible. <laughs> this is but, true. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know when when I was asked for the land latitude latitude and longitude of um, our tanks, I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then it was starting, to, you know, they're mapping out my exact water lines, and I'm thinking, I don't like the way this is going. Yeah. You know, this is like invasion of privacy on some level. There's just way too much um, exposure. You know, we're telling them every little detail about all of our processes, like where everything is. And our address and things like that are on public record. And that's something that I don't appreciate per personally. No. Um, and no, you know. no other ag business has to do that, no. right? No other ag business has to do that that way. You know, even dairy thing, they don't have water board issues, water quality board and all that sort of stuff. Fish and wildlife isn't down their throats. It's only us that they're targeting, you know? So it's really- Yeah, that's another thing when they're talking about this 10% of your acreage, where are they going to get the water to do 10 acres? Well, that's what I was going to say yeah. earlier is because you can't, I mean, I personally, I will not expand my farm. And in fact, I'm scaling down next year because of the water issues. We didn't get enough rain to fill our catchment ponds. And that is the water that we rely on to grow our crop. And if we don't have that water, we don't have a crop. And we have to be really, really strategic and very smart about it. And when we lose a tank of water, everybody cries. I mean, it's just painful. And, yeah, you know, I it's know. it's a real big problem. And as much as we do in-ground cultivation and we use regenerative practices and we get biochar and all these things to help, you know, preserve the water. And, and you kind of even almost have to train the plants from, from the very first moment they are, you know, in soil to not thrive off of shit tons of water. You really kind of want to give them the minimum so they can be vigorous yet not just suck up all the water. And so, you know, there's methods for that that a lot of farmers have learned in the past that if you don't give them a lot from the beginning, they won't require as much as through their life cycle. But, you know, that's touch and go. It's 110 degrees here for weeks on end and we don't get much of a rest at night and, and the plants yeah. are... The plants are out there turgid, you know, as, as much as they can be. And, but at some point they just can't handle that heat. And so, you know, we do go through a lot of water in, in the, in the height of the season. And, you know, unfortunately at, at some point, my husband and I have decided recently that the best way for us to, to sort of embrace the situation that we're in, you know, it's, that's kind of what it's come down to is like, we, we have what we have and we can't make more water you know out of thin air and so we do our best and what the way that we're going to um navigate this this year is scale down slightly and we do have a mixed light permit so we, we can grow um, light depth and full sun so we'll be doing triple down on our light deprivation for the first round this will be the first time that we've done that um, we normally have about oh less than a thousand square feet of um, light deprivation that we pull out in about end of July normally and then we focus on our full sun you know larger amount up to our 10,000 square foot permit which we've never maxed out anyways but um you know now we're gonna we're gonna do probably about six or seven thousand square feet of light depth um is the intent oh. and maybe some autoflowers thrown in there last year we did about a thousand square feet of light depth plus about 2,000 square feet of auto flower, which was a whole wild adventure. Oh. I'm not sure I want to do that ever again. It was kind of a little bit unreliable really? for us, but um, but so you know that's our way to utilize what we have when we have the most, and the heat isn't as intense. The bug pressure is not as intense at that time, and it's just a lot less stress. So I think what we decided is we're going to just really buckle down and and do more light deprivation um, earlier. So we'll be done with a lot of the, you know, the bulk weight and the stress of getting it to processing and, um, you know, having money to do all that too is a huge struggle every year. You got to 
kind of save up so when you get back to that trimming you have enough money to pay your people right um and these days yeah. paying the processing yeah. center <laughs> you know you can't skimp on that bill so it's kind of like uh you know you really have to be smart about it and and so that's going to be our i guess our compromise this year is doing more light depth pulling that in earlier and when we have the the greater stress of the heat the fires the pest pressure and water pressure and all that jazz um we'll we'll just pull in some nice beautiful big plants and we won't stress so hard at that point um so we'll see how that goes <laughs> how is the smoke over there how is the smoke in the fires where you are well when we, uh, so this summer just for so everybody knows um in mendocino county we had the largest fire in the recorded history in the united states um actually in the mendocino national forest yeah. it actually went through three i think three counties or did it end up being in four counties i can't remember quite yeah. but, um oh maybe it was it was, I think it was one county also, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was way out in this super remote area of the Mendocino National Forest, for the most part, um, did start coming down into some areas like Covalo, for instance, and um, a lot of our Mendocino Generations farmers were quite affected by that. And um, in fact, we're going to be doing a fundraiser for um, a couple of the farmers. We got a bunch of really beautiful calendars made that just showed up. Um, so I'll be doing a promo for that if you go on Mendocino Generations Instagram or Facebook and our website soon. Um, we'll be selling calendars where you'll get to see, there was about 12 farms that um, jumped on one for each month and submitted a lot of really beautiful pictures of their farm and, and their lifestyle. And so the money will go towards um, supporting a couple of our farmers, one who dropped out of Mendogen because they, didn't, they couldn't proceed with licensing and permitting. Um, but they lost a cabin. And then we also have another farm that just lost a fence. It was so amazing. The fire, the fire burned up to uh, wildland cannabis, you, you know, Jen and Joey. Um, and it burned right up to the fence. It burned the fence of their garden and didn't touch the cannabis at all. It was so amazing. Ah. So they really lucked out. They didn't lose ah. structures or anything. Um, so, um, you know, we're trying to do our best to help folks. It's It's been a hard year for everybody. And, you know, even those that weren't affected directly by the, the fire itself, um, the smoke did get down here. And I think the smoke went across the United States from what I saw on some smoke maps over the summer. Yes. Um, it was really intense. Um, you know, they were saying Kentucky had smoke from Mendocino County at some point. Um, and so, you know, people people were having a hard time and not just the people, the plants. And I don't know if you guys experienced this, but it was literally blacked out here. There was a day, um, yeah. there was two fires happening yeah. simultaneously. What happened, there was a fire that started in Willits, which if that's about half an hour north of me. Um, and the sky literally turned black. It was two o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon and you couldn't see. We were all walking around with headlamps and the sky was black and it was, the summer and we all were putting on parkas. I mean, we were freezing outside, shivering, trying to just deal with the situation. And um, it was really wild and ash was falling here and I'm sure it was falling on you too. And it was just everywhere. And the plants were collecting ash. And this was at the height of, what was it? I mean, it was like August, right? I'm, time is so weird at this point. I don't even remember, but. I think it was September. Of September. Yeah. Right. Because the bugs were September, really starting yeah. to set. And that's people were right. freaking out. I and mean, we went down to Costco scary. and bought a couple leaf blowers. And, you know, we were out there a couple times a day just blowing the ash off the plants. And, you know, it was really um, nerve wracking. Pardon me, not just even for the ash. Um, so when the sky is that dark for that long, the plants aren't seeing the right kind of UV light and and not enough of it. And I think a lot of people had this issue where um, the, the smoke was so thick that the plants didn't really know what time of day it was. And um, we saw a lot of plants tripping out <laughs> for lack of a better term, they didn't know what to do. And yeah. so um, some people yeah. decided to put some yeah. Christmas lights out there and try to sort of mitigate this this darkness issue and the smoke. Um, and I, you know, <laughs> it was kind of funny. We didn't end up doing that, but you know, we we did our best with just getting the ashes off and and um, 
you know, they were fine in the end, really. Everything was yeah. fine, but uh, but I, you know, you gotta worry nobody about seems the... to be complaining yeah. about smoke on the flower at the no. end. We had no. a similar thing. There was fires about 15 miles to the south of us, 15 miles to the north of us, and it was black. Well, I, th for I think sure. the lucky thing was that what was burning was national forest. And so it was yeah. trees burning. It wasn't Ukiah burning, for example. Right. So it wasn't, it wasn't all that cars and buildings and plastic. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It was organic smoke and ashes. But <laughs> I tell you, I right. still, I will take these days of snowstorms <laughs> over firestorms any day. You know, I would much but, rather. But be it this. was really fine white ash. It was really very fine mm -hmm. white ash, almost kind of like snowflakes, and it blow off pretty well yeah. we blew it up and then at the end we dunked our plants we dipped them in a very hydrogen peroxide in a barrel and then in the oh, water good. clean water afterwards and then let them hang dry and then we hung them inside it doesn't seem to have affected that at all there was other yeah. stuff that happened a little stunting maybe new terpenes will come out as a result uh <laughs> who knows you know right. it, it's unpredictable what that does yeah yeah, yeah it definitely. We had so, yeah, the other we set thing up I wanted to for that. Okay. We had tables of different buckets. So you'd have the harvest, then you'd have the first bucket that had. We used this product called Zeratol, which was um, had a little. We had to add a little bit of um, this coconut product. I can't remember. It's for a wet and a wetting agent, basically, so that the xerotol would actually do its job because the cannabis plant when it has um trichomes all over it is actually really hydrophobic it it sort of like repels the water so when you're trying to rinse stuff off it doesn't really get in there and so you have to set up this whole system it's not as easy as you'd think and so we'd have you know a station with eight people like you know four people on each side of the table you take the fresh weed and you'd kind of give it a shake in the air first you dunk it in the first thing you kind of take it through the process and shake it off and hang it in front of fans on cages and you know we did that for our light depth harvest it was pretty intense work more work than usual wow so, yeah wow yeah it was more work this yeah. year so and a lot of the water that we didn't have at the end of the season we ended up with 500 <laughs> gallons total in our tank before the Ooh. first rains came because we had to use so much water to wash off the plants yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, scary. we were we were sending folks to go shower at the ranch house because that's where there is a lot of water, and uh, you know we Who were showers. Showering. Nobody showers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you don't get to shower at that time of year. It's not part of the deal. You feel guilty flushing the toilet. I mean, these days we have real inside toilets. You know, yeah. when I was growing up, we had outhouses, but nowadays, you know, I just felt so guilty right. every time. We, you know, we try to pee outside and <laughs> do your best but uh yeah so chia do you have two children is that right you have two kids or i do i have two boys i have a my older son river is going to be 20 um in about a week um and my younger son is 13 right. and they were both born well, we can help you soon ha huh. right. you know it's funny because i and are I, they interested in getting into this business well <sighs> I don't know. I mean, you know, my older son, as you'll see in the Ladybugs movie, um, has, you know, he, he, she follows our story, you know, and so it was during this this really hard time in our lives where our older son was really interested in cannabis and went too far with dabs, which is something that when I was a teenager, that didn't even exist. I mean, there was hash and there was weed and, you right. know, some people were smart enough to right. collect keef, but, uh, you know, otherwise, like, um, you know, people were rolling finger hash when they were trimming and they'd smoke that, right? So, you know, he really got into what's what's called dabs. And if you guys don't know, it's like concentrated um, cannabis, right? And so he'd smoke off his pipe and he'd get way too high. And then come coming down was really intense. And so you kind of have to stay high to to maintain your sanity almost at that point. It's like you get so high from it that the coming down is so intense that he would just kind of stay, you know, way too stone. And he wow. wasn't being productive. He wasn't yeah. going to school. He wasn't doing his stuff. And so, you know, as a parent, I felt like a hypocrite because here I am smoking weed all day because that's me for my physical and mental <laughs> discomforts, you know, but at some level, there's a balance. There has to be a balance. And so that's, that's been really hard, you know, and he, then went the opposite direction. He now 
really doesn't smoke weed. He smokes CBD um, oh. cannabis for the most part, and he'll smoke socially with us and things like that. But um, he does help on the farm um, here and there. And, uh, you know, I really, as much as, you know, I, this is, cannabis is my life. I mean, I really, I always say like, I don't, I don't think I can get away from this plant if I tried, you know, it's just, it's, it's here to stay. Right. And so um, in we some understand. form or another. And so, yeah. you know, I never went off into the world and did things for myself. I never did that. And because I went straight from growing up in Mendocino County, cultivating weed, you know, with my dad, there was kind of a couple years there where my dad wasn't around during the later part of my teens. Um, he moved away to take care of my grandparents who were ailing and passing away. And so during that time, my husband and I got together um, and cultivated in my dad's old patches uh, for, for a couple seasons. And, and so, we, you know, we kind of just adapted or adopted that situation and then found our own land and, and moved down the road a little ways. Um, and so, you know, it's just kind of just been that way my whole life. I've never n not grown, you know, even when my dad wasn't around, I ran the garden, I planted plants, they got stolen, but you know, it's, it's like, you just keep it going. <laughs> yeah. You keep it going. But, um, you know, and so I never went off to college. I never went to go travel the world so much. I mean, we go on vacations and things like that, but I never did that for myself. And that is something that I really deeply want for my kids. I want them to go do what they want to do and experience the world. And cannabis is always going to be here. If you want to come home and grow at some point, do it, but really like you're never going to have an opportunity to be this age and, and have this much freedom really to go around and do what you want to do. So go do it. And that's where we yeah. were kind of at with my older son right now. He's 20 and he's done some college, but because of COVID um, he was doing online classes and he just wasn't inspired by that. So he's not doing that right now. Um, he's make, he's making music. Yeah. Um, that's his interest. Well, that's very, so he, very enlightened parenting. I have to say, you know, yeah. I know how it oh, is, and I and I still great. have that well, desire. I hope so, be a third gen. yeah, we'll see, right? Um, this is, you know, this yeah. is kind of the land well, that you don't just sell. It's not an investment. Of your guys, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe he'll live here. We have properties. Um, yeah. Exactly. All over because of both of our fathers. So they'll both have some land to deal with and and to figure out, <laughs> you know, what to what to do down the road. But. I'm sure yeah. cannabis will probably be part of their lives at some point too. Oh, well, I love the multi-generational yeah. thing. Let's let's talk a little yeah. bit about ladybugs. Um, yeah. We're lucky to have the producer of ladybugs okay. on the on the uh, and director and filmmaker and writer and everything Chris else. Russo. You know, Chris Russo. Hey, Chris Russo here. Chris, wave, Chris. Hey, Chris. Let's know who you are down there. Okay. So <laughs> great to see everybody. That's Chris. Thank you. Yeah, well, we are really excited that Ladybuds is about to come out. You know, I know COVID kind of held you up there for a little bit, but now you're ready to do it. And um, and Chia, you're one of the stars. I mean, that's going to be great to see you telling your story and actually see the video of your ranch and everything will be available too. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, Chris can talk more specifically and I can get into my experience if you want. Go for it, Chris. Well, I just want to say thank you for, uh, I, I love this, this uh, Zoom session. It's, uh, you know, in COVID, it's so nice to see my friends and familiar faces when I've been isolating for, what, a year now. Um, so I'm excited yeah. to announce that I am giving birth to the film. <laughs> it's been, yeah, <laughs> I've been like four years, February 2nd will be four years since from when I started, actually. Um, wow. Yeah, four years. And I wanted to do three years door to door, which I was almost able to do last year, but you know, the quarantine happened. Um, and I and I honestly had to shelve the film for the last year. And you know, she knows I was heartbroken and you know, it just was what it was. Um, but now I'm coming out of it, ready to get the film out there. I basically had to accept the fact that we're going to be screening it online. You know, I want, I, my being a filmmaker is so important to me because we get to interact with audiences and be, see it on the big screen and we're together and we have conversations about you know why the film was right. made who's in the film so anyway I'm gonna come up 
I'm going to come out with a big announcement um, in March. I can't talk about it yet, but that's prompted this whole fundraiser to try to get me over the, the finish line. And, um, you know, I was really intrigued by how much, how, how many women were in the space when I started investigating cannabis. You know, this was back in 2016 when Prop 64 was on the ballot. I, of course, was going to, I was going to vote yes. Um, and mm -hmm. I started to do research around, oh, I mean, honestly, like, where can I invest in cannabis? Like everybody, where, where? and then, you know, I just started thinking about it. I'm like, I should invest in like making a documentary because this is my passion. And so I started interviewing women and I learned how many women were like the backbone of the industry. And um, then I started to get invited to their farms. <laughs> and so when you get invited yeah. to a cannabis farm, you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had my Subaru Outback filled with camping gear and, and camera gear. And that was really the beginning of the journey. I interviewed over a hundred women. And over the course of several months, I distilled down what I thought were the most interesting and diverse stories to create this film. And it ended up being six women that I followed for two years, the one year leading up to like legalization being turned on and then the one year after. And, and I had no idea what to expect. I thought it was gonna be like, honestly, that was gonna be like rah, 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 women in cannabis, you know? And it was, it was struggle for survival. It was like the regulations coming down hard. It was big business coming in. It was spending everything they have to keep the farm going. And, you know, Sue Taylor, you know, spent 12 years trying to get her dispensary open. So right. I it really, um, I really responded to Chia and her story specifically because of the family element I thought was so unique um, to, to raise a family on a cannabis farm. That's not something many people are able to see or know about. And coming out of the shadows, which we had lots of conversations about, was a big deal. And I'm thinking, you know, me, it's like, uh, she wants to be authentic. She doesn't want to obviously, you know, run from helicopters anymore, that's not happening. But like, you know, have this worry always going on and raising the children under, you know, now legality. So I was very enamored by Chia and her story. And um, they were very generous with me for several years. And we spent a lot of time together. And um, it's a very personal, intimate look at Chia and her family. She's one story of it's actually five narratives because the Bud Sisters I count as one person, even though they're two people. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to tell this story. Um, she has seen the film. Um, everyone hasn't seen the film though. So no one's really seen the film. Oh. I, and I, I was up oh. in my, you know, was it in the fall? And I think I was up there on a job and I wanted to show the film to everyone in person before it kind of went wide. So, so yeah, and we touch upon, you know, the family stories and the, the, the conflicts of growing up on a cannabis farm and what you have to go through. And I hope that I, I, you know, um, I hope that I told the story, you know, with the truth that, you know, everybody expected. And, and I wanted to make sure everybody was really shown in a positive light. Um, but, you know, it, it it, it became very dramatic very quickly making this film through the fires, through personal um, injuries, through financial stuff with other people. The film is very dramatic. So <laughs> I can't wait for you to see it. And I thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk about it. I, I, I have so much gratitude for Chia, you know, for what she does, what, what she does for the community really comes through in the film. She's a real community organizer. And I think we all have a lot to thank her for that especially. Yes. Amen. That's so true. You, yeah. That's so well, true. We no, look forward she, to, is, she is a fountain of knowledge for so many of us up here. That's really true. We look forward to and seeing the film so Chris, when it comes out. Where can we see it? People are asking, where right can now, we see it? How right are we going to be able to see it? Okay. Well, I have to plug the GoFundMe campaign. Um, I'm trying to raise the last funds. You can see the brand new trailer on the GoFundMe link. And that's only going to be up for a few more weeks because I have a publicist now that's like, you gotta take everything off the internet, you know, for press coming up. So so go to the GoFundMe campaign. I think it's GoFundMe forward slash ladybuds. Okay. And then let's go that maybe up. Maybe copy and paste that link in there, in there Chris. Oh, I'll, I'll paste the link. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's and, a great idea. And just so people know what she said, it's L-A-D-Y-B-U-D-S, right? Good. So ladybuds. 
Yeah. yeah, so this is gonna be a premiere. It's gonna be a world premiere. And then honestly, this is gonna start a two year festival run. I think COVID's gonna benefit me a little bit because usually it's a one year festival run. And since things are online and I think things will open up for us to have like drive-in screenings or community screenings, hopefully by late summer. I mean, I'm being optimistic, but definitely into next year. And so I think um, Ladybuds will kind of be on the circuit for like two years. And then once, this is how it works. Once I get into film festivals, get press, then you know we, we sell the film to like a streamer or some some place where everybody can view it, you know, anytime. But right mm -hmm. now it's gonna be very like specific to different film festivals. And just uh, stay tuned to the Ladybuds Instagram page and the Facebook page. And I'll always be posting where you can see it because I know everybody's dying to see it. And I can't wait for people to see it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. No, we're excited. Yeah, and, and I have to do a big presentation up here in Mendo. Yeah, or more than one for sure. Yeah, <laughs> more than one, right. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. We really do need your help. If it, any spare change, if you could go to the GoFundMe, I know I, I hate asking for it, but like this is, this is, you're, you're, be proud to be a part of this film. So when this comes out, you'll be like, hey, I supported that film and I'm damn proud of it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Chris, you're brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thanks, you're brilliant. Thank you. That's really excellent. <laughs> seeing you guys. <laughs> Yeah, always is. So anything you want to add to that, Tia, about the uh, about film? Lady Buds? How much fun that was? Yeah, well, um, Chris is laughing because I'm always like, I didn't know what the heck I was getting into. I met her at a Emerald Exchange event in Malibu, California, and uh, she came around to my booth. And at that point, we have a brand called Arcana Flowers, and uh, she came by the booth and you know started talking to me and then she's like would you mind we could just get a few minutes on film and ask you some questions and I went through that and then uh I invited her to come up to the farm and then she invited me to be part of the film so um yeah we've been we filmed for a couple seasons um three I think was it three or three full harvest three. seasons yeah um Wow. And um, really, you know, Chris has become part of the family at this point. Um, she, you know, her and her various helpers um, through the years ha would come and stay and, you know, we'd have big family dinners and events and things like that here and celebrating different things together. And so um, it's a fun experience, you know, really like I had no idea what I was getting into and I kind of thought it was going to be a real short kind of like interview situation, but it was very intimate, um, you know, really diving into the family life and, you know, my kids just dis despite <laughs> all things, they're, they're um, good sports. They had a little bit of a challenge <laughs> with being on film in the beginning. They thought, oh, cool. You know, we're going to be in a movie and um, you know, it, it became intense and you know you as you'll see there's like all these ups and downs with with the family and with me and my husband you know some funny moments of bickering and, uh, and things on film but <laughs> um you know that's how it that's is like during harvest reality. you know yeah it was, it was real life <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, really yeah. real, real no, exactly. life, it's you know, and, and it, it does sort of sound like it's going to be a cannabis day in the life of reality shows. Yeah, right. It, it really was. I mean, it was during that time that um, I had a broken back. Um, I there was oh. one full season where I couldn't walk and I ended up having back surgery during harvest season. And um, so basically I was MIA and it was really intense you know I laid on my back for like six wow. months and uh yeah and so that was really hard you know that put an extra layer of stress yeah. and yeah. um you yeah, know so it's true. real there's a lot of raw moments some a lot of tears on everybody's part not just our story but you know all the stories are really cool I mean she really Chris really found somebody from each sort of like section of the industry I mean there's there's so many so many stories to be told out there but she really does um pull it all together and you know talking to an, an activist and you know farmers and and distributor and the and the dispensary side and you know there's a lot of a lot of drama and a lot of tears and you know people work so hard I mean we we spend our 
last dollar trying to make this work, you know, and we continue to do it just like you probably do. You know, it's just like, it's just, you have to do it. So you do it and you figure it out and you know, it's, it's hard. It's, and there's fun moments too. We definitely have fun in the garden. It's not all stress. And, you know, my favorite thing is just like smelling all the, the wonderful turbines, you know, it's like, we forget about all the good, <laughs> good parts. Sometimes when we're filling paperwork out and doing metric track and trace. Yes, right. <laughs> exactly. No, we have to remind ourselves of no, that. No, when you walk out into the garden, the, the plants sustain you while they're growing and so on. It's that joy yeah, of, of so being true. with the plant and seeing how they respond. Like you were saying before, when the top leaves are reaching up to the sun, you know, in, in late August and so on, and you just know they're like vibrating with energy. Yeah. And you know, when oh, I'm stuck yeah. in my office, Chia, doing that dreaded paperwork that we have to do all the time, you know, I just try to think about the benefits of being legal because there aren't that many. But, um, <laughs> but right. the one main benefit is really the fact that people that are getting access to this cannabis that would not do it otherwise, because not everybody's going to go to the guy down the block, you know. So it really did open it up. And the fact that, you know, we are learning more about it medicinally every day because it's more open now. And, and it is it will soon be federally legal. It soon will be worldwide legal. All of that's going to happen. And we're just the pioneers here on the edge of the mountains and the forests. And we're doing the work it takes to get it to that point. But so it, there really are, there are benefits. You know, it's, it's, I mean, the fact that we can sit here on Zoom and talk about it and not have to be hiding in the bushes, right? You know, I mean, right? I smoking guess weed on a on video on a, <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, we forget how radical that is. Yeah. We have to remind ourselves sometimes, you know, it's like I was laughing because um, a friend of ours, they have a farm up in Humble um, Honeydew Farms and uh, they have these uh, t shirt that says, like, I will love you even through harvest. It is a struggle, right? It's it's like all the stress of everything yeah. kind of culminates at that moment and if you don't do it right you could screw up the whole season all in you know one foul swoop and and so you know it's it's high stress but you know the plants give so much to us and you know i owe my life to cannabis in a lot of ways and physically you know yeah. i would so not, i would not have your back for, for cannabis during my back injury and surgery and all that and um, right yeah. yeah. I bet. I bet. No, that's excellent. I'm sure, you know, that's, that's when we really find it. Cause uh, that must've been tough. I can't imagine that Chia being so down with. Yeah. And somebody like me, who's a well, Virgo and a total go-getter, it was like excruciating, uh, you know, my mind to, to not be helpful and not being, you know, doing something all the time and even making food for my family. Right. And so thank goodness for my, you know, my best friend, Chastity, she was on the, I thought she was on the call earlier, but I think they went off. But anyways, you know, she came and stayed with us and cooked my meals and literally wiped my ass. I mean, I, you know, it was that intense. And so it's, you know, it was no fun, but we made it through it and, you know, we're stronger for it and you know we really actually during that, that time that's that to, community yeah. you were talking about before in our yeah. culture that we always did help each other through it right we couldn't talk about right. it but we did communicate you know telepathically in a way and people would have seeds and starts and how to grow this and you have a you have a pest problem or what do you do about gophers or whatever they are you know and that was you know we've got we have to try and hold on to that family community thing you know, however we can <laughs> That's yeah. so true. You know, we live on Greenfield Ranch, right? Yeah. Which is this intentional community. People moved here to be within community. And it has since the beginning sort of people have their little homesteads and they communicate and they go to parties, but it's not like it was back in the day, but there still is this such a deep and intense sense of um, community yeah. and family exactly. and, and kind of like responsibility. And it really it bumps your integrity level up so much because you're so you have to be like you're you're in the light all the time of you know who's out there working on the roads who's showing up to the meetings who's you know paying their dues and who's not and who's being a friendly neighbor and you know it's like for us this yesterday and today is like 
Um, so many people showed up to help us um, with these trees. We couldn't, we have three exits for my house. We have a fire exit, which is a backup emergency. And we have two driveways and we could not get out. I couldn't even walk off the porch. And so people showed up left and right cutting trees and and bulldozing the way and uh, you know helping us out and my husband busted his knee yesterday and uh yeah chris is shaking her head yeah he busted his knee <laughs> so we're kind of like you know we're we're down on help and it's it's hard and um you know so the community showed up my neighbor shows up this morning with a giant bag of kiwis and a chainsaw you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> wonderful thank you that's that's what this community is all about that's why we moved where we moved that's why we stay here and um you know as much as we sometimes dream about moving to costa rica which we will you know maybe part of the year at some point live down there but right now it's like you have you know you just realize that when when the shit hits the fan people show up and help you and and i do that for other people and i hope that they would do that for me and they really really did so it's great to see right right when a neighbor shows up uh, with that's, yeah. saw, that's next level love there yeah <laughs> right, exactly. exactly exactly right, right. well well Chris, i mean Chia, you really deserve it you help so many people up here yeah. we're very aware of that and so thankful for everything you do for our community and helping people get along and keep any going questions? i mean it's really because of you that we get inspiration you know it's people like you and because of the work that we're doing the devotion to the work even through all that hardship that you know, we keep going. And, and I really appreciate that you're sharing this today so that people out there who might not realize what we go through to grow this plant, you know, it's not like you're just growing roses in the back garden. So, you know, it's really, um, it's great to hear it from, and I love the fact that you're a second generation, you've been doing it so long. It's really special to hear your stories. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you know, we, you know, we try to. I guess I'm just a community organizer, and I say we, and you know, my husband's a hermit, but you know, I kind of um, have always been that way, and that's because of the way I was raised on this land, and it that was instilled in in me. You know, my parents started the co-op that is here, which is you know, the Homestead Exchange was started on Greenfield, and um, you know, everybody really just has that, um, they just have good hearts, I guess, is, is kind of what it comes down to. And I was taught that. I was taught that you you give what you can, and when you don't have enough, somebody else can, can step up for you. And, you know, and so I try to instill that quality in my children and still act that way with community you know neighbors we just had a neighbor pass away a couple weeks ago and drove off the road and didn't make it and oh, um oh, you know the, no. the community yeah like you know as much as she is my direct neighbor and and as much as i couldn't stand the woman for a lot of reasons <laughs> um you know you gotta just love her up it was like you know just innocent old lady really in the end and like here we are the whole community stepping up to to help out and clean up the mess and and deal with it and you know and throw memorial and all those things and it's like that's what community is really for we have a lot of people that live here that have lived here for 40 50 years that don't have children and they're out by themselves in the middle of the woods and they don't have firewood or the ability to cut it and you know all those kinds of things and so as the younger generations grow up we teach them teach them the ways and and hopefully they they pass that on too so oh, that's so oh, that's beautiful very good so, so beautiful. Uh, before we sign off uh, is there what kind of special products do you have in cannabis what distinguishes and what's the name of your yeah, brand Arcana. Tell and, us where, a little bit and about where that. can you get your products and can you talk a little bit about that stuff because people may want to know sure thing um arcana flowers is our brand and you can find us um, we have a combined Facebook page with Mendocino Generations and Arcana Flowers on Facebook because um, Mendocino Generations, the corporation that we started for that, had intentions of cultivating and having a dispensary on, at some day, but we didn't we didn't end up doing that. But um, so that brand owns the Arcana Flowers brand. So we have those combined, and on Instagram they're separate. Um, 
and um, we have a brand of just straight good old fashioned Mendocino County hand trimmed cannabis. And, um, you know, we don't really get into anything fancy. We're not into wild fancy products and all these new fangled things, but you know, we just really appreciate our flower and we like the way that it looks when it's treated right and trimmed right. And so that's what you get. And it's, um, been really successful for us. And actually, um, you know, we've had the brand since 2015, but, um, through, legalization a lot of the dispensaries we worked with closed and the way to get the product to them got harder and so we you know we just uh we had some ups and downs but we found the right distributor thank goodness um and now we're distributed by cosmic distribution there in santa rosa and they're just really doing us right you know like we've had uh experiences with every single issue you can imagine from distributors by being literally ripped off by them to you know and so uh you know we we're in a good spot right now and we're in over 100 dispensaries across the state um and our beautiful you know rainbow of flavors is out there and getting some really great feedback and attention right now so um we have one of my favorite strains which i um was just smoking a joint of it uh, earlier is the Wookiee cookies. And um, my husband has a thing for Star Wars. So we have a little bit of a Star Wars theme going on. Um, we have the Jedi Knights and the Wookiee cookies. And, and yeah, so right. we like to play around with, <laughs> with funny names. But yeah, we got a lot of our genetics came from what Swami yeah. was talking about earlier is like, your neighbor says, Oh, I got some extra plants. Do you want this plant? And, and what started out for us is, um, uh, we had some some Afghan Kush came along at some point, and then we had the Romulan, which is something you don't really see these days. But I actually, really love that strain. Yeah, you um, yeah, yeah, I know. I haven't seen it for years, just just straight. But um, yeah. so the Romulan came in at some point, and then we had the Blue Dream, which of course is sort of overused and uh, abused for a few years there. But um, then we also um, you know, we got this plant from a friend and he says, I don't know what the heck this thing is, but you can have it. And uh, we called it the mystery OG because nobody knew what it was. And so the mystery OG has played into pretty much all of our genetics over the last um, 22 seasons, my husband and I have been cultivating together. And so we really just um, have fun playing with crossing things. You know, it's kind of like an experiment. You don't know when you're going to find the unicorn, but you're just going to play around and see what happens. And, and sometimes you find one. So um, we have a really fun uh, array of strains, uh, you know, a lot of um, hybrids, but we have some great um, more, you know, straight indicas and more leaning on the sativa side, but most things sort of land in that hybrid category anyways. So if you're in California, stop into a dispensary and check it out. We're on, we also have a website, arcanaflowers.com. It's arcana, A-R-C-A-N-N-A, um, which is a play on words. Arcana with one N means the great mystery that a plant holds within it. And um, we added another N for the cannabis play on words nice. there. And so um, you can learn more about our story on the website. And um, and if you go to a dispensary and they don't have our stuff, you'd be sure to ask them to get it and help us out. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Wow. And if they don't have it, walk out. Unless they have something <laughs> yeah, <right>. select. <laughs> yes, or buy another small farm. I mean, that's the, really the crux of what I do on a daily basis is to educate people about the importance of small sun-grown cannabis farmers and the heritage factor there but the sun-grown factor is is so important for a lot of reasons and and health reasons too as as you might know you know cannabis gets um it can actually come into its full expression in the sun plants that are grown inside under lights don't have all the spectrum of light and so Plants that are cultivated outside actually have so many more terpenes um, present in, in the final product because they're just growing in, under the natural sun. They're exposed to so many things. So, you know, it, sun grown is superior for sure. So definitely if you don't see our stuff, get something from another small farm and be sure to tell the, the bud tender 
why you're buying from a small farm. And, and actually that reminds me to mention that our next guest in a couple of weeks from now, this is gonna be an interesting conversation, is Kyle Cushman, who's really, the master indoor grower written books. He's very into the whole indoor growing scene and he lives in the city or somewhere. So, you know, I get it. He has to do that. Yeah. We're right. going to have an interesting heated discussion. I'm sure as we talk about the well, uh, differences between well, indoor. We've and kind of changed our ideas about indoor partly as a result of the fires and partly out of the yeah. fact that some people can only get indoor because that's all it's legal. Some people can only get indoor because that's all that grows there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we really, I really think actually it's a very different plant and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to compare them one to one, you know, one to the other. You know, there are people who want and need and can only get the indoor, so that's what they have. Uh, I do agree that the, the outdoor, the sun grown, as we like to call it, is charged up for six to eight, <laughs> eight, 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 nine, seven months by the sun and nothing can compare with that. Uh, so uh, that's why we promote it. And then uh, it's also much easier to grow organically when you're growing outdoors in the full sun. Yes. And as Chia mentioned also, uh, we're, we're trying to move much more and more into regenerative agriculture, where we're actually you know, reconditioning the soil as we work it, and that those nutrients that go into the feed the plant are really feeding the soil and making the soil uh, more alive and so on. And so that's part of the process. And when you have really living soil that's with local ingredients, then you get a truly unique product uh, we didn't talk about the uh, terroir and Appalachian chia, but oh, yeah. we probably better leave that for another time. <laughs> but uh, the more regenerative you grow cannabis, the more your Appalachian is particularly uh, influenced by your immediate climate. So that's what we're looking for, for at sure. some other point. Yeah. Well, we could talk for hours. I'm sure about that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so great. Thank you so yeah. very, very much for oh, coming we, on. We learned a talk. lot from you this time and yeah. also just local history. I think we're really always glad to get that too. Thank you. And the woman's perspective, which as cannabis is the female plant. That's right. We play God, you know, our, it's our goddess cannabis. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you. And Chris, we can't wait to see the movie and it's going to be great. And <laughs> be well, Chia. I hope no more trees fall on your house. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Thank you. I know it's a touch and go out there because a lot of things are still hanging from above, but um, yeah. yeah, thank oh, you so yeah. much for having me and thank you so much for, you know, um, doing this. I've only joined in, I think, uh, well, I've watched some of your videos. I've never actually joined in when it was live, but I've watched a bunch of them after and, and they're always, you know, very interesting and fun and, you know, they have your your uh, special touch on them. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody for being here. It's great to see all your faces. And don't forget to go fund me for the movie. Don't forget to go fund me for the movie. Yeah, I got a plate. Thank you, Sloane. Thank you. <laughs> okay, blessings and love to